All right, so uh, this is the fifth uh, edition of Everything Matters, which means we're talking about the fifth element from the periodic table, boron. Uh, but before we get to boron, we're going to take a step back and look at the entire periodic table of the elements and talk a little bit about where this shape comes from. Uh, so this is the periodic table. Every box in this table represents a different kind of atom, and these are all of the atoms we've ever observed. And uh, so you can kind of think of this as being like the Lego kit of the universe. Anything you're going to make is going to have to be made out of these raw materials. This is all we've got to work with here. Uh, and it's not just a list. It's obviously laid out in a certain way. Uh, so there's some structure here. So for example, if you look on the far left, there's Li for lithium. Uh, all of the atoms in that column uh, are very chemically similar from lithium down. They're all metals. Uh, they're all very soft, which means you, soft enough you can cut them with a knife. They all explode uh, to varying degrees when you put them in water. Uh, so that's a family, which we call the alkalis. Uh, on the opposite side of the table, you have a column called the noble gases. So these are all gases. They're all inert, so they don't react with anything. But right next to them are the halogens, and these are highly reactive. Uh, most of the ones in the middle there, that's where most of your common metals are found. So these are sort of grouped according to chemical family. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, trends in the periodic table. So these are roughly laid out according to weight. Uh, if yellow is light and brown is heavy, they kind of get heavier as you sweep down and to the right. Um, in terms of states of matter, most of your gases represented in yellow are in the upper right, and things get roughly more solid as you sweep down and to the left. So th the point is it's sort of uh, riven with all these associations and trends, and you can learn a lot about an atom just by knowing where it sits in the periodic table. So I want to compare this to an earlier table of the elements that was used by the ancient Greeks. Um, this is what we used to think the universe was made out of. Everything was either fire, water, earth, air, or some combination of these. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about an early attempt to improve upon this system that was made by Plato in his dialogue Timaeus, where he introduces these five shapes, uh, which are now known as the platonic solids. So if you look at any one of these, uh, all of the edges are the same length. All of the faces are regular polygons. Uh, each face is the same polygon, and the same number of faces meet around each corner. So these are as regular as a three-dimensional faceted shape can be. And the Greeks knew that these were the only five shapes that had that degree of regularity. So Plato thought, well, maybe that's significant. Maybe I can use that, for instance, to explain why the elements are what they are. Uh, for example, maybe fire is a tetrahedron, that if you could zoom in on a flame at a microscopic level, maybe you'd just see a bunch of elemental tetrahedrons floating around. And the reason fire burns you is because when you touch it, you're actually getting micro-stabbed by all these tiny, pointy things. Uh, maybe the big round one, maybe that's water, because it won't stack up. It'll kind of spill and roll, and maybe the fluid nature of water comes from the shape of these atoms. Uh, maybe the Earth is a cube, because cubes do stack up well, and maybe the solidity of matter comes from the fine packing of cubes, and maybe the octahedron is air, because something has to be the air, and maybe the <laughs> dodecahedron with its 12 sides represents the 12 signs of the zodiac. It's sort of space itself. It's the container in which all these other shapes sort of combine to form the material world. Uh, and then he goes on to try and do a kind of natural science with this idea. So he looks, for instance, at lightning. Lightning is maybe a kind of fire, so it's full of tetrahedrons, and it's combining with the air air, which is octahedrons, and that gives you a lot of triangles. So for instance, if you take one atom of fire and two atoms of air, that gives you enough triangles to make one atom of water. So that's a theory about where rain comes from. And I really love this theory because it's totally wrong. Uh, but at the same time, Plato's trying to do a lot of really interesting things. He's, first of all, he's trying to understand the seeming arbitrariness of the natural world using a mathematical idea. And while he's incorrect, this is going to turn out to be a really winning strategy for understanding nature. Uh, but he's also doing something that a number of Greek philosophers had done up to that time, which is that he's just looking really closely at matter and being like, what, what's going on down there? And of course, we, we know what was going on down there. It wasn't little polyhedra. It was actually the atoms of the periodic table. So this is the full layout of the periodic table. And you can see that it, it's not exactly regular, but it's not totally irregular either. It kind of has this progressive uh, stair-step structure to it. And we usually ruin that by breaking out the actinides and lanthanides and putting them at the bottom, uh, just because this kind of fits on a poster better. Um, 
But there's actually a lot of different ways you can configure the atoms of the periodic table. So for instance, if you want to emphasize the periodicity of the table, uh, you can do a sort of expanding spiral where, say, you start with hydrogen in the upper left and sort of work your way out. And then eventually, you sort of hit the metal lobe and the, you know, the rare earth lobe. But if you Google alternate periodic table, you can find there's actually a whole bunch of these that people have come up with. There's a, a lot of ways to kind of configure the chemical relationships among the atoms uh, beyond just the periodic table. Uh, so if you're looking stuff up, uh, obviously a table is the most convenient format. But the thing to keep in mind is that there's an embedded chemical structure here that may need some explaining. So the physicist Richard Feynman was once asked, if he had to summarize all of physics in one sentence, what would it be? And his answer was, all things are made of atoms. And this is uh, a pretty good synthesis of all of physics, just in the sense that the discovery of atoms represented the culmination of thousands of years of natural science. Uh, but it's also central to the story of physics in another way, which is that once you've discovered the atom, you've actually arrived at a really important threshold in nature. Basically, everything from the atoms up is governed by what we now call classical physics. And this is the physics that you and I are experiencing right now, where everything has a very specific location and velocity, and everything rotates in a familiar way. Uh, but once you've discovered the atom, uh, you can ask, what's it made of, or what gives it its chemistry? And in order to answer that, you actually have to move beyond the world of classical physics uh, and into the world of quantum mechanics. And uh, Niels Bohr, one of the creators of the theory of quantum mechanics, once said that anyone who isn't shocked by quantum mechanics has not yet understood it. And this conception that quantum mechanics is shocking or confusing or weird has kind of, that reputation has followed quantum me mechanics around since its inception, which is kind of unfortunate because from a mathematical perspective, there's nothing that shocking or even all that interesting about quantum mechanics. It boils down to a single equation called the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and in order to use this equation, you would need to know some probability theory, uh, some linear algebra, and some functional analysis, but these are all undergraduate classes, so you could, in theory, just learn the math, uh, and there wouldn't be any quantum mechanics problem you shouldn't be able to answer, it, it, <laughs> at least in theory. Um, what's confusing is that as beings who live according to classical physics, the predictions of this equation are very unfamiliar. Nature's just really different at a small scale, and what's not often emphasized is that it's actually different in a way that makes a lot of things way simpler. So, for example, consider the electron, uh, which is one of the particles that's in every atom. Uh, the electron doesn't look like anything, but I'm going to represent it here as a ball with a stick through it. Um, when the electron is bound in an atom, it kind of behaves like a little toy with three adjustable settings on it. So the first setting is the energy level, which we denote with the letter N. Um, and in classical physics, an object can be given any, in a, any amount in a continuous range of energies. But in quantum mechanics, the electron can only take on specific energy levels. So the lowest energy level is n equals 1. Uh, if the electron takes on any energy, it graduates to the next level, which is n equals 2. And it can kind of go up from there to any integer. Uh, the next adjustable setting in the electron is L, uh, and this governs the rotation of the electron. And again, in classical physics, you can rotate an object around any axis at any speed, but the electron is much more limited in how it can rotate. So for example, at n equals 1, it actually can't rotate at all. It's not until you get to energy level n equals 2 that you can set L as high as 1. And when you do that, it doesn't just set the electron rotating, it actually opens up a menu of rotational options. Uh, so the last adjustable setting on the electron is a way of choosing from this menu of options. It's denoted by the letter M. And M always ranges from negative L to L. So in this case, from negative 1 to 1. So you have three rotational options at this level. And those options remain available at every subsequent energy level. But at each subsequent energy level, you can set L as high as uh, one more. So at n equals 3, L can go up to 2. M ranges from negative 2 to 2, so we have five rotational options at this level. Um, at n equals 4, L can be set as high as 3, uh, which gives you seven rotational options. And this pattern continues regularly, in, in theory at least, forever. So uh, these are all the sort of dynamical uh, states that an electron can be in in 
an atom. So when you're doing classical physics, you have to deal with decimals or fractions. But when you're talking about the electron in an atom, it's basically just this counting game with whole numbers. But there's one other trick the electron can do. It does this weird thing. If you wave a magnet at it, you can get it to essentially turn itself inside out. Um, and this is a strictly quantum mechanical thing. There's no classical physics analog for this kind of behavior. So the more you try and visualize what's actually happening here, the more you're just going to give yourself a headache. So this is one of those points where quantum mechanics starts to seem like it's really weird. But from a mathematical perspective, there's nothing strange here. This is predicted by the Schrodinger equation. There should be two symmetrical but distinguishable states, and the electron has to be in one or the other. And we call this the spin state of the electron. And for technical reasons, we denote it with the letter s, and it's either 1 half or negative 1 half, which means that all of these states we've talked about before, uh, each of them has a twin state, which represents the electron doing the same thing while inside out. Uh, so these are all of the dynamical states uh, that the electron can take on inside of an atom. And uh, quantum mechanics also predicts that these states, some of these states should actually be easier for the electron to get into than others. So they come in a specific order, and uh, this isn't exactly right. Um, for example, uh, one, some, one of the non-rotating states should actually come between two of the rotating states, uh, and that kind of continues all the way down. And I'm leaving out a few details and some of the boxes for clarity, but this is essentially correct. This is the order that these boxes should come in, but you can see our formatting is now all screwed up. So we're going to move these around without uh, changing their order. So for instance, you can do a kind of carriage return uh, and get all, oh, sorry. We can kind of get all our non-rotating states lined up vertically. Uh, those guys hanging out on the lower left, we can sort of back them up to the ends of the rows before them. We can get all our L equals 1 states pushed over to the right. Uh, and for good measure, you can get every box that completes an energy level justified all the way over to the right. And uh, if you were paying attention at the beginning, this shape should be looking kind of familiar. Uh, quantum mechanics actually predicts the structure of the periodic table. Each atom has one more electron than the one before it, and that electron enters the next available energy state. And the electrons are the active chemical ingredient in the atom. So the chemical properties that we discovered in the periodic table correspond to the pattern of electron states predicted by quantum mechanics. And this gives us a theoretical point of view for thinking about matter. And this helps us understand the chemical properties of the atoms. Uh, it helps us understand the spectral lines of the gases. Uh, it actually helps us understand a lot of things that would be really confusing otherwise. So for instance, if you look at which atoms have magnetic properties, um, they come in kind of two clusters. There's the ones on the right, which are sort of the uh, materials that are in the darker magnets uh, from, from, <laughs> from olden times. And then we have those new, really shiny, really strong magnets, the rare earth ones. Those are made mostly of the material on the lower left. But the thing to notice is that all of these magnetic elements ha occur kind of along the north coast of the periodic table. And quantum mechanics has a fairly complicated explanation of why that actually has to be the case. In order to be magnetic, an uh, element has to appear kind of along the top edge of the periodic table. Uh, this is cerium. Cerium, if you cool it down, it actually goes through something called a volume collapse, where it loses about 15% of its volume. Uh, quantum mechanics has a Fairly complicated explanation of why that happens. Uh, this is helium. Helium, if you cool it down enough, it becomes a fluid. And if you cool it down even more, it becomes a superfluid, which uh, is a zero viscosity fluid that leaks through ceramic containers, creeps up walls, and forms spontaneous fountains. Uh, quantum mechanics has a fairly complicated explanation of where those behaviors come from. So if we think back to Plato's theory uh, of matter, um, he was basically trying to explain the material world using a simple mathematical idea. Um, and he was wrong, but in a way it was just because his theory was too simple. If you think about the relationship of the Schrodinger equation to the modern periodic table, you can see that it, it actually kind of fulfills Plato's dream in a way. It's a simple, concise mathematical statement that somehow encapsulates the bewildering variety that we see in the material world. And, uh, Granted, it's a lot more complicated than the platonic theory of matter. But then again, so is the thing it's trying to explain. So the point is that um, although quantum mechanics has a reputation for weirdness, its greatest practical success is in explaining the familiar. So, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. How about a hand for Paul?